اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والحمد للہ اللذی جعلنا من المتمسکین بولایت امیر المؤمنین ولائمت المعصومین علیہم السلام والحمد للہ اللذی ہدانا لہذا وما کنا لنہتدی لولا ان ہدانا اللہ والحمد للہ اللذی لا یبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يودي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود فطر الخلائق بقدرته ونشر الرياح برحمته وودد بالصخور ميدان أرضه ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد محمد وعلي محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلي على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Then we begin this sermon the way the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhima afdalu salatu wa salam. Would begin many of his sermons by advising us, Usikum ibadallah bi taqwallah. That I advise you, O the servants of God, to be God conscious, God fearing, and pious human beings. Alhamdulillah, it does look like a good Friday. You know, it's good for you in that you're off of work today, and it's good for me that I'm not limited by time today. Yeah, so it will be a good Friday for all of us, inshaAllah. Every year. The different khutbah of Jumu'ah Salah are asked to participate in a green khutbah where we talk about effective ways of looking after our planet and they call it green their deen where we promote greater environmental awareness and that's what I wanted to spend today talking about. One of the undeniable facts that we are all undergoing is climate change. Unfortunately there are people who are denying that there is climate change, but science has clearly proven that it is something that we are undergoing and it's something that will have devastating effects on us in the future. Uh, to give a little bit of background, you know, life on Earth is possible because of the warmth of the sun. If the warmth of the sun was not there, we would freeze to death. And when the rays of the sun come onto the Earth, some of that radiation bounces back into space but a small portion of that heat is trapped uh, due to the delicate balances of gases that exist in our atmosphere and that's what keeps the warmth of the earth there. Um, basically it is insulated, right? And it's because of this insulation um, that we are able to survive. If it was not because of this insulation that God has created for us, we would be another example of a frozen planet basically, right? Because everything would just bounce back up. This insulation that we have, um, the most important gas that is insulating um, is carbon dioxide. 
That's the most important gas that is there in our atmosphere that helps, helps us insulate. However, what has happened over the course of time, you guys have followed me so far, yeah? Um, what has happened over time is that so much carbon dioxide has now been released um, due to different activities. And a lot of these activities are there because of human beings' actions. Um, the two most um, devastating effects of releasing carbon dioxide that we are part of is number one, burning fossil fuel. Um, so that is burning coal, burning oil, and burning gas. And the second one is deforestation. The amount of trees that have been cut down, it's because of these two events that has released so much carbon dioxide into the air that today's atmosphere contains 42% more carbon dioxide than before the industrial era. Yeah? So there is a greater amount of carbon dioxide that now exists in our atmosphere. Um, and basically, because of all of this carbon dioxide that has been released, um, and, and the other greenhouse gases as well, that our planet's atmosphere now is like a thick heat-trapping blanket. Yeah. So we are containing and we have too much heat now because of all of the carbon dioxide that has been released. Um, to give you an example of some of these uh, gases and what we have done, 11% of all global greenhouse gas emissions are caused by deforestation. So 11% of this extra gas that is there is because we have cut down trees. This 11% is equivalent to all of the cars and trucks that are there on the planet. So you add another 11% because of that. There are, there's a higher level of concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. As of 2018, there are 408 parts per million, which is the highest it has ever been in 3 million years. That's how high it is right now, all in our watch, all in front of our eyes. And the Earth's temperature has gone up by 1.69 degrees Fahrenheit over this past century. Now, I know that that seems like a little, right? But when you look at the devastating effect that these, this temperature increase, again, you've understood why, right? Because there is this atmospheric blanket that is trapping this heat because of the extra release of carbon dioxide, because of our hands. Um, we've seen devastating effects. Today, there are over 800 million people, or 11% of the world's population is, is currently vulnerable to climate change impacts such as droughts, floods, heat waves, extreme weather events, and sea level rises. Worldwide, the number of climate-related disaster has tripled since 1980. Yeah? Events such as extra hurricanes, events such as extra floods, tsunamis, all of these things has increased, the melting of ice caps, all of these things have increased by um, three times more than 1980. And this is not even, if we were, to, we're not even addressing the issues that climate change has had on animals, right? We have found so many animals have either become extinct or their habitats have changed altogether um, that they are on the verge of extinction. We are at record levels, you know, we are at record levels. And the most saddening aspect is that we, human beings, you know, are firmly responsible for everything that's happening on this earth today. Um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we sometimes take the earth for granted, don't we, right? Um, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded us often that this is an amanat that has been given to us by Him. This is a, a trust that has been given to us by Him. And the earth will tell its story back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We recite in Surah Zilzal, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا yeah, when that earth will shake with its mighty shaking and it will throw out its burdens. What are the burdens? We are the burdens. Yeah? We have been a burden to this earth. And then the human beings, when they are thrown out, will say to Allah, what's wrong with her? And that's when Allah says that the earth will retell its story of what we have done to it. It's a beautiful gift that Allah has given. That I know that in many instances, you and I are not maybe... Um, firmly responsible, we can blame it to industrialization, we can blame it to consumerism, we can blame it to all of these things, but we can play a role in this. We can. Um, and so we're going to talk about three things that we can do 
all of us, I think that we really need to have this, especially the young children that are here. I want you to go home and pressure your parents to do these things, right? Because honestly, sometimes the number one way change happens is because our kids want it to happen, right? So the kids that are here, this is your future that we're talking about, how you're going to survive in the future. So the number one thing that we can do is curb our consumption, okay? Um, in the United States, and of course, we have to just look at that as a smaller group here. But Americans buy 20 billion new items of clothing each year. Yeah? 20 billion items of new clothing and send 10 million tons of clothing to landfills. 10 million tons of clothing are just thrown away into landfills. What can we do? We don't need to go shopping every weekend. Yeah? Sorry to break it to you. We really don't. Right? You know, when our kids are young, we have to buy them clothes all the time because they outgrow those clothes. Recycle them. Give it to somebody else within the community who has younger children. Don't just throw them out. But when we get to a certain age where we stop growing, maybe just growing this way instead of this way, you know? Um, but when we stop growing this way, we don't need to buy things so often. We really don't. We need to learn to curb our consumption because all that happens is that we end up throwing away things. And even when we donate them, you know, if you've ever spoken to someone who works at a Goodwill or works, they say a majority of the clothes they get are just thrown away, right? Because we give away the stuff that we don't want that's ratty and torn and these type of things. What are they going to do with those things, right? And so majority of these things are thrown away as well. And we're all responsible on this. So curb our consumption when it comes to buying things. Number two, worldwide, about one third of the food that is produced for human consumption is lost or wasted before it even reaches our plate. One third of the food that is brought by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine how we're going to answer to God for that. You know, imagine that. I really want us to think about that because we're all going to be a part of this. Um, this translates to 3.3 billion tons of carbon that was released because of wastage of food. That amount of carbon um, that is wasted, that is created because of wastage of food um, equals to as much greenhouse gases. It's the third largest producer of greenhouse gases after United States and China. Yeah? The amount of food that is wasted. If it were a country, it would be the third largest producer of greenhouse gases. We can all play a part in that, right? And from that, in Canada alone, Canadians waste approximately $31 billion of food each year. And 47% of that is wasted at home. So 47% of the food that we get gets thrown out. And think about that, right? We have people who don't like to eat leftovers. We have people who don't like to, they just like to buy food and then see it rot in their fridge. We're all responsible for this, my brothers and sisters. And so we have the role to play. So number one, curb our consumption. I'm hoping the kids are remembering this. You need to pressure your parents. Number two, conserving energy. Right? Um, conserving energy, we are told, is the easiest way to reduce carbon emissions. In Canada, households are responsible for 329 megatons, or approximately 45% of the country's greenhouse gas emissions are by the energy that you and I use on a daily basis. This means that we have to learn to better handle what we have in our houses. For example, we need to better handle the thermostat in our house. Right? It's okay to open the windows from time to time rather than having the AC on. Right? Um, put an extra jacket on or a sweater on rather than having the heater on all the time, for example. Changing the light bulbs in our house to go towards a more energy efficient light bulbs. Making sure that we're not wasting water. Using the dishwasher in the evenings or at nights. Using the laundry at nights. There are so many different things that are there. We've all received newsletters from um, the Peel region or whichever region we live in. Follow these things because it's having an impact on how we are currently all living together. So number two is conserving energy, right? Number one was what? Consumption, curbing our consumption, right? Number two is conserving energy. Number three is well, another area that we can all work on is commuting smarter, yeah? Commuting smarter. The average North American 
emits around 5,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year from driving alone. Right? Each person, when they drive, they emit 5,000 kilograms. Now you multiply that by every car and truck that's on the road. Right? Imagine how much we are releasing into our atmosphere. There are things that we can do, right? So for example, um, some of us really need to learn this, effective driving. Yeah? Effective driving, studies have shown that up to 30% can be saved in fuel um, if, if we just change our habits of driving, um, how we accelerate, how we slow down, maintaining a steady speed, checking tire pressure, these simple things, right? But can actually increase the amount of gas life we have so that we don't have to fill up quite often. Um, smarter commuting, right? Um, taking public transport, for example. Walking sometimes is a good idea. Biking is a good idea. Or I know a lot of us now have the ability to do this, but working from home whenever possible. We don't need to drive out if we can work from home. These are just some examples, right? But it falls on us now. It falls on us. We've been given this amazing amanat by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most beautiful planet, right? But it's how we take care of it that we'll see whether or not our children and grandchildren can live in peace the way we have lived in peace for so long. Wa akhiru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. Sadaqallahu al-aliyul azim. Salli ala Muhammad ala Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين صريخ المستصرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين اللهم صل على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين محمد اللهم صل على وآل محمد وصل على سيد الوصيين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين صل على محمد وآل محمد وصل على سبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة صل على وصل على علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة القائم المهدي وما صل على محمد وعلي صلاة لا غاية لعددها ولا نهاية لمددها ولا نفاد لأمدها اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات وتابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك على كل شيء قدير Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This weekend, inshallah, we are going to be celebrating the wiladat, the birth anniversary of our living Imam, Sahib al Zaman, Ajalallahu ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And as well, participate in the amal of Shabi Bara, where we 
one of the most important nights of the year inshallah so tomorrow night we will see you for the amal inshallah and sunday for the mehfil and the celebration inshallah i wanted to touch upon this because it's an important responsibility just as we talked about of the previous responsibility of looking after the creation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of our primary responsibilities that we have is to prepare for our imam we get in traditions that afdalu a'mal ummati intidharu farajillahi azza wa jal he says the afdalu a'mal the best of actions that my ummah can do is to prepare or actively prepare for the coming of the imam this is a responsibility that you and i have you know whatever we do in life it's always a good idea to remind ourselves whether or not this particular action that i am doing is going to increase the likelihood that our imam will come quicker yeah and sometimes yes there may be an activity that doesn't have that impact whatsoever right um for example i could be watching the raptors lose i mean win i could be watching the raptors win you know um and <laughs> i had to sorry i had to yeah um i've been taking a lot of flack for the lakers as it is so i had to throw something back you know um i could be watching the raptors play and there's nothing wrong in islam about watching the raptors play right but that may not necessarily be bringing the imam back quicker but at the same time the secondary question would then be is this delaying the coming of my imam right and if it's if it's honestly just a moment of relaxation where i sit back and watch islam encourages that but in other moments i have to ask myself these two questions at all times is this increasing his arrival or the speed of his arrival or will it delay and if the answers um are not what our heart wants and we may have to change what we are doing because every moment in our lives should lead us towards that path of increase of and actively anticipating for his arrival we've often talked about it but it's worth repeating that how do we prepare for our imam alayhi salam you know the preparation can be understood in two ways we have an individual responsibility for our imam and then we have a societal responsibility the individual responsibility starts with making sure that i am an individual that the imam alayhi salam would proud to have and yeah, to be with to call his his shia right and so i have to constantly have checks and balances in my life i constantly have to weigh my actions and measure my actions against the actions of what a believer is supposed to be it is not unknown to us what a believer is supposed to be it has been described to us clearly that a believer does these things a believer avoids these things and every so often if not every single night i have to look within myself to see if i'm on that track of being a believer and if not then it's something that i have to honestly look into my life to try to remedy so the first resp- individual responsibility i have is to constantly weigh my actions against those of a believer to see if i'm on the right track other thing that is really important for us to do is to strengthen our bonds with our imam right this is something we often talk about but it's it's crucial that every single day i make sure that i say salam to my imam it's important and i'm not talking about the ziyarats that we recite at the end of salah right because that has become ritualistic now right this ziyarat at the end of salah literally has has become something to let everyone know the program is finished yeah that that's what it's come to it is we become routine for us right um but when we say out of the blue randomly salam to our imam that will build a relationship with the imam that is better than anything else so say salam to the imam once a day we're not asking for rocket science here right every action that i do dedicate the thawab of that to my imam when i take every day or every week when i take out sadaqa make sure that it, my niyyah is for the safety of our imam these are ways in which we can build very simple relationships so that when the imam comes I'm not a stranger to my imam we've already had a relationship that goes back many years and that we can start going forward right away the second area of responsibility we have is within society yeah 
there is this notion sometimes that we have that the Imam will come and the Imam will fix it. Yeah? The Imam will bring justice. The Imam will do this. As if we don't play a part in that. Right? If we're not creating an environment of justice and adalat within myself individually, within my family, within my community, within my neighborhood and society, then I'm not doing anything that will help the Imam salam's job when he comes to it. You would think, right, that after 1400 years, the seeds would have been planted, the watering would have been done, the nurturing should have taken place. All we need the Imam is to come and show us how to harvest this plant. Yeah? But if we're thinking that the Imam has to come and now he's going to plant the seeds and he's going to... We're mistaken. We have a responsibility in our society, my brothers and sisters. We need to learn to be generous. We've been talking about that, haven't we? Where we need to lift and uplift the community around us so that everyone is playing on an even field. We need to be ambassadors of Islam, to give a positive image of Islam so that there is not this negativity that is always there when Islam is mentioned. This, is hap this happens how? By us participating in activities outside this walls, right? I think we've done a great job of building our mosque, alhamdulillah, right? But what have we done for the wider society? Have we shined a positive light in Islam by helping the needy, by helping the less fortunate, by participating in interfaith activities? Have we done anything within our society to make sure that laws and legislations that are passed are within the framework or acceptable to Muslims. I've talked about this often and I'm repeating this because it's important. We need to participate in the greater system that is around us, whether it is through societal factors or whether it is as well through civic engagement. I know we talk about this every uh, Good Friday, um, but it's important to remind ourselves about it. Many of us are shy or for whatever reasons do not want to participate within the civic framework that is created. What does that mean? That means being part of a lobbyist group, taking out and voting, encouraging other peoples to vote. There's the Canadian Muslim vote representatives, you'll see them, they're wearing unique shirts, alhamdulillah. You'll see them, go speak to them if you have any questions about this. But can I just give you an example of how important it is? This is an example from two weeks ago. We had talked about how the Canadian government had come out with uh, a safety report. And within that safety report, for the first time, they said that, the, that a rising threat within Canada is white nationalism. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. But then in that same report, they said the greatest threat to Canadian safety comes from Shia extremists, Sunni extremists, and Sikh extremists. Yeah, um, You know what the Sikh community did immediately? Immediately they protested. Yeah? Immediately they called all of their MPs, then they called all of the elected officials that they had helped support and helped get elected, and they came out with a blanket statement. And they said that if you do not remove the word Sikh extremism from this report, no other politician is ever allowed to enter a Gudwara to seek votes. And they, they unanimously, they united, and they unanimously said this. Within a week, Canada changed that report. Within a week, they took out Sikh extremism from there. You'll no longer find it in that report. But Sunni extremism exists, Shia extremism exists. Why? Because we don't have a united voice. We don't. They are yet to take us seriously because we are yet worrying about ourselves. We're worried about Imam Kabayaga. Yeah? This is helping the Imam come. Imagine if we create an environment in which there is no notion that there exists extremism within Sunni or Shia Islam. Right? By saying Sunni extremism and Shia extremism, they are saying that extremism exists within Islam. Right? Well, we know that those who have extremist views are not considered within the Islamic framework. But no one has raised that voice to them. Today we're having a meeting at 4 o'clock where, alhamdulillah, all of the imams within Peel have, have called all their MPPs and are going to give a similar message to them. 
right? For those who can attend, you should attend. This is happening at the Mosque of Jamiatul Ansar on Heart Lake and um, Great Lakes, I believe, on Beauvaird. But if you can come at 4 o'clock, come, because we need to show a united front, because this is not acceptable. But we have to engage. We have to engage and talk to the brothers and sisters who are here today. They will tell you how we can positively engage to bring this change for our Imam, because that is our ultimate goal. وَآخِرُ دعوان أن الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا عصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صدق الله العلي العظيم.